Welcome to a gripping and eye-opening journey into the world of incarceration, where youth collide with the harsh realities of confinement. In this compelling video, we delve deep into the lives of the most dangerous teens in prison. Prepare to witness the untold stories, the chilling experiences, and the stark truths that unfold behind those imposing prison walls. This is a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and a stark reminder that sometimes, even the most dangerous paths can lead to redemption. David Moses. In a haunting tale of tragedy and justice, our first entry unravels the story of David Deshaun Moses, a man whose path was forever altered during a fateful burglary that left an 81-year-old woman, Dorothy Session, fatally injured. On a solemn Wednesday, justice was once again served as Moses was resentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. This prison term mirrored the sentence he had been serving since his initial conviction in 2012. The court had the discretion to potentially lessen his sentence to 25 years to life, yet the gravity of the crime and Moses' conduct during his time behind bars left no room for leniency. The necessity for this resentencing arose due to additional considerations introduced for cases involving juveniles tried as adults for murder with special circumstances, as was the case with Moses. An appellate court had vacated his original sentence, directing Kern County to reevaluate his youthfulness, background, potential for rehabilitation, and more. Judge Charles R. Bramer presided over the proceedings, rendering a verdict that emphasized Moses's lack of efforts toward rehabilitation since his conviction. The evidence presented during the trial painted a harrowing picture of the brutal assault he inflicted upon Dorothy Session, leading Judge Bramer to conclude that he deserved a lifetime behind prison bars. While Moses was reminded that redemption was a possibility, it was a journey that must unfold within the confines of his prison cell. Judge Bramer's words echoed a profound truth, that the path to redemption is a personal endeavor, one found within oneself and in communion with one's maker. This tale serves as a stark reminder of the enduring consequences of choices made in youth, the unyielding pursuit of justice, and the delicate balance between retribution and the possibility of redemption. In response, Terry Pelton of the District Attorney's Office said most, people as juveniles have done stupid things, but when you look at the population of the world, he said, the vast majority grow up without brutally beating an 81-year-old woman to death when they're 17. Session was accosted in one room, then dragged to another where she was further beaten, Pelton said. She suffered a broken nose missing teeth, cuts to her mouth, and black eyes. This was a senseless, violent attack on a frail woman, Pelton said. He added that Moses's behavior in a group home was abominable. He committed multiple crimes, including stealing cars while there. Pelton listed convictions Moses had from incidents that occurred both before and after Session's death, establishing his lengthy criminal history in arguing against his potential for rehabilitation. As the courtroom drama unfolded, the prosecutor, Terry Pelton, added another layer to the case. He presented a report from a doctor who had examined David Deshaun Moses and concluded that he remained a risk for further violent behavior. In light of this assessment and the gravity of the crime, Pelton argued vehemently that the only sentence that could adequately protect society and serve justice was a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Moses had not acted alone on that fateful day. He had been accompanied by two co-defendants, sisters Angelique Nash and Katilla Nash, both of whom had also been convicted of murder in the death of Dorothy Session. During the crime, Moses had entered the elderly woman's house alongside Katilla Nash, who was just 15 years old at the time. Meanwhile, Angelique Nash, then 17, had served as a lookout during the burglary. The Nash sisters, although not physically involved in the assault on session, had been convicted under the state's felony murder rule. At the time, this rule stated that a defendant could be found guilty of murder even if they weren't the actual perpetrator, but had committed a dangerous act, such as robbery or burglary, that inadvertently led to a death. However, recent changes to the felony murder rule had granted a lifeline to Angelique Nash. Just last month, she had been granted a motion for release from custody under this altered rule. The updated law now required a person to have actually committed or aided in a killing, or to have had the intent to kill during the commission of a crime, in order to be charged with murder. Those who previously could have been charged with murder were now eligible for charges. Related to the underlying crime, be it robbery, burglary, carjacking, or another serious offense, a further court hearing for Angelique Nash had yet to be scheduled, leaving the legal proceedings in this complex case far from concluded. Shandell Jackson the courtroom can be a place of intense drama, and one such moment of shocking reaction occurred during the sentencing of 19-year-old Shondell Jackson in 2010. 
Jackson had been convicted of first-degree intentional homicide and robbery in the tragic case of 21-year-old University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee student Nathan Potter. The details of the crime were chilling. Jackson, along with 20-year-old Derek Thomas, had attempted to rob Potter, who was simply walking home to his apartment. In a senseless act of violence, they shot Potter to death, despite him not carrying any money. What made this case particularly distressing was Jackson's demeanor during the trial. He displayed no remorse or sorrow over the victim's death or his own crime. In a disturbing twist, he even smiled at Nathan Potter's grieving family when he was escorted out of the courtroom. Nathan Potter's father, John Potter, found himself addressing Judge Rebecca Dallet during the trial. He acknowledged that no words could bring back their beloved Nathan, but he implored the court for a punishment that would match the horrific nature of the crime. In a haunting question, he asked, is there such a thing as pure evil? We think so. When the sentencing was delivered, condemning Jackson to life in prison with no possibility of parole, his reaction was nothing short of explosive. He directed a barrage of curses at the judge. The police in the courtroom, seemingly anticipating this outburst due to Jackson's behavior during the trial, acted swiftly. They had to physically restrain him and even used pepper spray to bring him under control. While Jackson's response was intensely volatile, what happened next was equally distressing. Members of Jackson's family, seated in the back of the courtroom, began hurling insults at Nathan Potter's mother after the sentencing. They spewed hateful words like, I hate you, I hate you all, and invoked religious sentiments with phrases like, God's the judge. The shocking nature of this courtroom drama prompted strong reactions from observers. Many expressed their outrage at Jackson's actions and his family's behavior. Some found it difficult to comprehend why Jackson's family would lash out given the heinous crime he had committed. The focus shifted towards the Potter family, who had already endured the devastating loss of their loved one and the grueling ordeal of the trial, only to be subjected to verbal attacks. Shondell Jackson's case serves as a chilling reminder of the profound impact of violence on both victims' families and those caught in its web, and it raises unsettling questions about the boundaries of empathy and human behavior in the face of tragedy and justice. Philip Chisholm the story of Philip Chisholm is truly horrific and will give you goosebumps as you go through it. On October 22, 2013, a 14-year-old Philip Chisholm did the unthinkable to his 24-year-old maths teacher, Colleen Ritzer. At such a tender age, Philip brutalized his teacher in the most horrific way possible, leaving the society at a shock knowing that Ritzer was such an over-enthusiastic teacher who would go out of her way to help students reach their potential in maths. The story goes like this. In 2013, Philip had recently moved to Danver, Massachusetts, where he wasn't well well known in school, other than the fact that he was a good soccer player. He was called antisocial by students of the same school, and according to a report, his mother was going through a bad divorce when the crime was committed. Chisholm reportedly grew upset at Ritzer when she had mentioned him moving from Tennessee, but Ritzer had tried to change the subject multiple times, after which Chisholm had started talking to himself. Ritzer had complimented Chisholm for his drawing skills at the end of the class and told him to stay late in school so they could work on his math skills together. Hours later, he did the unthinkable. On the morning of October 22, 2013, the newly installed security camera system at Danvers High School captured 14-year-old Chisholm arriving at school with numerous suitcases, which he placed in his locker. His suitcases contained a box cutter, mask, gloves, and a change of clothing. According to the New York Times, Ritzer was seen leaving the classroom and heading to the second-floor women's lavatory at roughly 2.54 p.m. Chisholm is then seen strolling into the hallway, looking her way, disappearing back into the classroom, and reappearing with his hood over his head. Chisholm followed Ritzer into the same restroom, putting on gloves. Chisholm then raped and stabbed Ritzer after stealing her credit cards, iPhone, and pants. Chisholm was dressed in a variety of costumes throughout the crime, which authorities later claimed demonstrated how he had planned the murder in advance. Chisholm exited the washroom with a hood over his head and proceeded outdoors to the parking lot at 3.07 p.m. He returned two minutes later, dressed in a new white t-shirt. Chisholm then returned to the classroom wearing a second red hooded sweatshirt over his head, and at 3.07 p.m. 16 p.m., he returned to the bathroom with a recycling bin. He reappeared wearing a white t-shirt and a black mask, dragging the bin with Ritzer's body towards a lift and then outside the school. He lugged the bin all the way behind the school to a wooded area. When neither Chisholm nor Ritzer were seen after school, they were both reported missing. After interviewing with students and staff at the school, authorities discovered blood in the toilet, Ritzer's bag, the bloody recycle container, and Ritzer's bloodied clothing near the cross-country trail in the woods behind the school. 
the CCTV material was obtained and analyzed by 11.45 p.m., and Chisholm was named as a suspect. Meanwhile, Chisholm used Ritzer's credit card to purchase a movie ticket, then left the theater to take a knife from another store. He was wandering down a darkened highway near Danvers when he was stopped by police on a routine safety call around 12.30 a.m. A quick scan of Chisholm for identity turned up Ritzer's credit card and driver's license. Chisholm was to the local station, where his rucksack was checked and Ritzer's purse and pants as well as the box cutter smeared in dried blood were discovered. According to court filings, when asked whose blood it was, Chisholm responded, it's the girl's. When asked where she was, he said chillingly, she's buried in the woods. At 3 a.m., investigators discovered Ritzer's half-naked body covered in leaves beside a pair of dirty white gloves. A branch had to be extracted from her vagina, and a folded handwritten message said, I hate you all. Philip Chisholm was charged with Colleen Ritzer's murder, aggravated rape, and armed robbery. He was convicted as an adult and sentenced on February 26, 2016. He was charged with murder, aggravated assault, and sentenced to serve at least 40 years in prison. Aiden Fucci. The horrifying case of Aiden Fucci revolves around the brutal murder of 13-year-old Tristan Bailey on Mother's Day, May 9, 2021, in St. Johns County, Florida. This shocking crime sent shockwaves through the community and left everyone grappling with its senseless brutality. Aiden Fucci, then 14 years old, was arrested on a first-degree murder charge in connection with Tristan Bailey's death. The circumstances surrounding this case are deeply disturbing and reveal a disturbing pattern of behavior leading up to the tragic event. Tristan Bailey, a beloved student and cheerleader at Patriot Oaks Academy, was one of five children in the Bailey family. She was known for her joyful spirit and positive influence on those around her. Her disappearance and subsequent discovery as a murder victim shook her community to its core. Aiden Fucci, a fellow student at Patriot Oaks and a neighbor of the Bailey family, became the prime suspect in this gruesome murder. Disturbingly, friends and acquaintances of Fucci reported that he often discussed violent fantasies and had explicitly mentioned his desire to kill someone. Despite these troubling statements, Fucci had no prior criminal record. On the night of of Tristan Bailey's murder, a friend revealed that Fucci had requested her phone number. He persuaded Tristan to leave her home and meet him at a friend's house. Surveillance footage captured two individuals believed to be Fucci and Tristan walking together toward a retention pond area. However, only Fucci returned an hour and 45 minutes later, alone and carrying his shoes. An autopsy later revealed the horrifying extent of Tristan Bailey's injuries. She had endured 114 stab and cutting wounds to her head, neck, shoulders, arms, hands, and back. Shockingly, at least 49 of these wounds were identified as defensive injuries, indicating her struggle for survival. During the investigation, Fucci provided inconsistent statements about the events leading up to Tristan's death. He initially claimed to have been with her at a mutual friend's house, but eventually admitted to getting into an argument with her, leading to a physical altercation. Initially charged with second-degree murder, the state attorney's office upgraded the charge to first-degree murder, premeditated, due to the extreme brutality of the crime. Fucci was charged as an adult, despite being a minor at the time, compounding the horror of the case, social media played a role in the investigation. During the search for Tristan, a Snapchat message posted by Fucci emerged, showing him in a patrol car, seemingly making light of the situation. His disturbing message and subsequent responses from friends fueled suspicions. Further evidence against Fucci included a buck knife found in a pond near Tristan's body, which matched a fragment embedded in her scalp and was traced back to Fucci. Additionally, investigators discovered wet clothing and shoes with blood in Fucci's room, as well as violent drawings in a notebook. Cell phone records, emails, Snapchats, recorded phone calls, texts from jail, and interviews with friends, family, teachers, and fellow inmates all contributed to the case against him. During interviews, Fucci's girlfriend disclosed that he often carried a knife and made threats about killing people, even pretending to slit her throat from behind. Despite these alarming statements, she and others did not take them seriously. Fucci also claimed to hear voices in his head when angry and stated he was on antidepressants. As the case unfolded, disturbing incidents occurred while Fucci was in jail including fights, possession of contraband, bullying other inmates, threats, and combative behavior toward guards. Inmates reported that Fucci boasted about his crime, asserting that he was real because he had stabbed a girl face to face, unlike those who used firearms. In March 2023, just before jury selection was set to begin, Aiden Fucci changed his plea to guilty. He was subsequently sentenced to life in prison by Judge R. Lee Smith, who described Tristan Bailey's death as painful, horrifying, and the crime as heinous, atrocious, and cruel. Fucci's conviction ensures that he will spend a substantial portion of his life behind bars with the possibility of a lighter sentence only after serving 25 years in accordance with Florida law. James Fairweather 
James Fairweather, a name that would become synonymous with heinous crimes, committed a series of brutal murders that shocked the community of Colchester, Essex in 2014 and 2015. These horrific acts left two innocent victims dead and put the entire town on edge. At the time of the murders, James Fairweather was just 15 years old, making him one of the youngest serial killers in the UK. He attended Colchester Academy and had struggled at school, partially due to an undiagnosed case of dyslexia. Fairweather's troubled upbringing was further compounded by the death of his grandmother in 2012, which had a profound impact on him. Fairweather's first victim was 33-year-old James Atfield, who had a brain injury from a previous car accident. Atfield was found brutally stabbed to death in Castle Park, Colchester in March 2014. The extent of the violence inflicted on him, with over a hundred stab wounds, was described as too gruesome to detail. Fairweather later claimed that voices had compelled him to choose Atfield as his victim. Three months later, in June 2014, 31-year-old Saudi student Nahid Almanea was murdered in a similarly gruesome fashion on Salary Brook Trail near her home. Fairweather stabbed her in the abdomen and then forced the knife into her eyes and brain to ensure that she could not see evil. The initial investigation was challenging, and Fairweather managed to avoid suspicion by providing an alibi during questioning by Essex police. Over 900 potential witnesses were interviewed as part of the investigation, and multiple arrests were made in connection with Atfield's murder. Fairweather's arrest came in May 2015, when he was spotted acting suspiciously by a dog walker. He was found wearing rubber-gripped gloves and carrying a knife, leading to his apprehension. During psychiatric assessments, Fairweather revealed disturbing thoughts and claimed to hear voices urging him to commit violent acts. Fairweather's trial took place in January 2016 at the Old Bailey. He denied two charges of murder and possessing an illegal weapon, but admitted to two charges of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility, claiming to suffer from psychosis. However, a court psychiatrist did not find evidence to support this claim. Despite his age, Fairweather was found unanimously guilty by the jury in April 2016. He was subsequently sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 27 years. His attempts to appeal the sentence were rejected. Fairweather's shocking crimes left a lasting impact on the victim's families in the town of Colchester. His young age at the time of the murders and the brutal nature of his acts raised questions about the factors that contributed to his descent into violence. Several documentaries have covered the case, shedding light on the disturbing details of James Fairweather's crimes and the enduring trauma they inflicted on the community. Jennifer Mee Jennifer Ann Mee, born on July 28, 1991, gained international fame as the Hiccup Girl due to her prolonged and uncontrollable case of hiccups. However, her notoriety would take a dark turn when she became involved in a murder case that would ultimately lead to her conviction and a life sentence in prison. In 2007, at the age of 15, Jennifer Mee became a media sensation when she developed an inexplicable and persistent case of hiccups. Her story captured the attention of the nation, and she made numerous appearances on television shows in search of a cure. Me claimed to hiccup up to 50 times a minute, and her quest for relief became a subject of fascination for the public. While the causes and treatment of her condition were widely debated, Me's popularity as an internet search topic endured. She attempted various remedies, including ingesting sugar, peanut butter, and even having people scare her. Eventually, her hiccups were brought under control with the help of Dr. Bob Linda, marking the end of her hiccup girl persona. After her hiccups subsided, Jennifer Me's life took a darker turn. In 2010, she met a man on online and invited him to a vacant home. There, two of Mee's friends, Lamont Newton and Laren Rayford, robbed the man of a small sum of money and fatally shot him. Mee's role was that of an accomplice to the crime. The victim, Shannon Griffin, was led to the back of the vacant house, where Mee's friends were waiting with a handgun. He was shot four times, and the police initially could not determine which suspect had pulled the trigger. All three individuals involved, including Mee, lived together and were arrested shortly after the crime. They admitted to their involvement in the robbery and murder. Jennifer Mee's journey through the legal system was marked by various developments. Before her trial, her lawyer, John Trevina, offered to have her plead guilty in exchange for a 15-year sentence, but this proposal was not accepted. During the trial, the prosecution presented a recorded jailhouse phone call in which Mee stated, I didn't kill nobody, I set everything up, it all went wrong. Experts also testified that Mee's DNA was found on the victim's shirt. Her defense team argued that Mee had schizophrenia and even suggested that her earlier hiccups were a symptom of Tourette's syndrome. Despite these claims, she was deemed competent 
attempt to stand trial. In 2013, Jennifer Mee was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Her co-defendants, Laren Rayford and Lamont Newton, received the same sentence for first-degree felony murder. Mee's attorney sought a new trial, but this request was denied. Her sentencing was the subject of criticism, with claims that it was disproportionate compared to what a similarly situated male might receive. Jennifer Mee's remarkable transformation, from a media darling due to her hiccups, to a convicted murderer garnered national attention and raised questions about the criminal justice system's handling of her case. Danta Wright Danta Wright, aged 18 at the time, found himself at the center of a tragic case involving the murder of Jordan Klee, a high school student from Ann Arbor, Michigan. The incident, which occurred on October 4, 2016, resulted in the loss of a young life and had a profound impact on both families involved. Danta Wright was one of three teenagers accused of attempting to steal controlled substances, clothing, and shoes from Jordan Klee. In the course of this robbery attempt, Wright admitted to shooting Klee, ultimately leading to his death. Wright's actions, along with those of his co defendants defendants Jermarius Ellison and Delrano Gracie had severe consequences. Jordan Klee's life was tragically cut short, robbing his family of the chance to see him grow up. Klee would have been in his senior year at Pioneer High School at the time of the incident, with all the hopes and dreams that come with that pivotal year. Danta Wright was sentenced to 25, 52 years in prison in July 2017. However, during the sentencing hearing, Judge David Swartz considered revoking the sentence as he observed Wright smirking. This demeanor in such a serious situation added to the emotional turmoil experienced by the victim's family. The case of Jordan Klee's murder is a heartbreaking example of the devastating consequences of criminal actions. Wright's involvement in the crime led to a lengthy prison sentence, leaving behind a grieving family and a community impacted by the loss of a promising young life. T.J. Lane in the quiet town of Chardon, Ohio, the morning of February 27, 2012, dawned like any other school day. But within the walls of Chardon High School, a harrowing tragedy unfolded, forever etching the name T.J. Lane into the annals of infamy. Thomas Michael Lane III, known as T.J., was a name that would become synonymous with a horrific act. Born on September 19, 1994, he was just 17 years old at the time, a seemingly ordinary teenager. But on that fateful day, the veneer of normalcy shattered. Tensions had simmered beneath the surface. Office, hidden rivalries and personal conflicts that culminated in an unthinkable act of violence. T.J. Lane was no longer just a student, he was the perpetrator. In the early hours of that February morning as students gathered in the cafeteria, chaos erupted. T.J. Lane, armed with a .22 caliber handgun stolen from his own family, opened fire. His target was clear, a group of students that included Russell King Jr., a young man who had unwittingly found himself at the center of Lane's fury due to a past romantic involvement. Panic gripped the cafeteria as shots rang out. Five Five students bore the brunt of Lane's rampage. Three lives were tragically cut short. Daniel Parmator, Russell King Jr., and Demetrius Hewlin. Their dreams and aspirations extinguished in an instant. The aftermath was a blur of grief and disbelief. T.J. Lane fled the scene, but was swiftly apprehended by law enforcement near his car parked just outside the school. He would soon face the consequences of his heinous actions. Legal proceedings ensued, and Lane's fate was sealed. He would be tried as an adult. In March 2013, he stood before the court, admitting his guilt. His punishment, three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. The Chardon High School shooting, forever etched in the nation's memory, left behind a community scarred by the loss of innocence and the profound tragedy that unfolded within its halls. T.J. Lane, once an ordinary teenager, became a symbol of the darkest of human impulses, a name forever associated with an act of unspeakable violence. Antonio Barbeau in a small, close-knit community in Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin, a chilling incident unfolded in September 2012, forever altering the lives of those involved. At the center of this grim narrative stands Antonio Barbeau, a teenager who went from a seemingly ordinary life to one marred by a shocking act of violence. Antonio Barbeau's story took a dark turn when he and his accomplice, Nathan Pape, were accused of the heinous murder of his own great-grandmother, 78-year-old Barbara Olson. The details of the crime were both gruesome and heart-wrenching involving the use of a hammer and hatchet in the bludgeoning of their elderly victim within the confines of her Sheboygan Falls home. The legal proceedings that followed cast a harsh light on the young defendant. Barbeau initially pleaded not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect, raising questions about his mental state at the time of the crime. A psychiatrist's testimony shed light on cognitive issues stemming from a traumatic event in Barbeau's past, a car accident that occurred when he was just 10 years old. This incident, it was suggested, could have played a role in shaping his 
his behavior. However, in a surprising turn of events, Antonio Barbeau entered into a plea deal that changed the course of his trial. He pleaded no contest to first-degree intentional homicide, a move that marked a critical step in the legal proceedings. This plea deal came with a significant concession. Barbeau would be eligible for parole in 36 years. During his sentencing, Antonio Barbeau struggled to articulate the remorse he felt for his actions. His emotional barriers were evident as he tried to convey the profound regret he harbored within. His lawyer ultimately stepped in to express the gravity of Barbeau's remorse, acknowledging the irreparable harm he had caused. Barbeau acknowledged the pain he had inflicted on his victim's family, recognizing that his impulsive actions had torn apart countless lives. Antonio Barbeau's tragic journey from a troubled youth with cognitive issues to a perpetrator of unspeakable violence serves as a grim reminder of the complex interplay of circumstances that can lead individuals down dark paths. While his actions will forever haunt the memories of those affected, his own life will be defined by a lengthy prison sentence and the distant hope of parole in 2048 when he reaches the age of 50, a stark contrast to the youthful innocence he once possessed. Dexter Johnson the life of Dexter Johnson is a harrowing tale of violence, tragedy, and the devastating consequences of a criminal rampage that left lasting scars on countless lives. Born in 1986, Johnson's name became synonymous with a string of brutal crimes that culminated in the double murder of Maria Aparace and Huey Ngo in 2006, an act that would lead him to death row in Texas. Dexter Johnson's descent into infamy began when, just days after his 18th birthday, he embarked on a month-long crime spree that shook the community of Harris County, Texas. Alongside four other teenagers, Johnson embarked on a violent journey that included carjackings, robberies, and ultimately, cold-blooded murder. The horrific incident unfolded when Johnson and his accomplices carjacked Maria Aparis, 23, and Hoi Ngo, 17, while they sat in her car outside Ngo's house. What followed was a terrifying ordeal as the victims were taken to a secluded area. In an act of unspeakable brutality, Johnson raped Aparis before he and another member of the group shot both victims, ending their young lives. Maria Aparis and Hui Ngo were not the only victims of Johnson's criminal spree. Harris County prosecutors revealed that his crime spree spanned a mere 25 days and involved three additional murders, painting a chilling portrait of a young man who appeared to be consumed by violence. The legal battle that ensued following his conviction was marked by a focus on Johnson's mental state and the issue of intellectual disability. His defense argued that he was intellectually disabled, making him ineligible for the death penalty under U.S. Supreme Court precedent. The debate around intellectual disability had become central to Texas death penalty law, with shifting standards and ongoing legal challenges. Despite Johnson's appeals, he was sentenced to death in 2007, and his journey through the criminal justice system was marked by tumultuous courtroom scenes, emotional outbursts, and claims of innocence. Throughout his legal battles, he maintained his innocence while grappling with a history of schizophrenia and brain damage, which his defense argued contributed to his actions. In a courtroom filled with sorrow and anguish, Dexter Johnson's fate was sealed with an execution date set for May 2nd. The victim's families, whose lives had been irrevocably changed by the crimes, sought closure. Johnson, however, continued to vehemently deny his guilt, even as he addressed the court. As Dexter Johnson's story illustrates, the criminal justice system grapples with complex cases that involve a multitude of factors, from intellectual disability to mental illness. His actions, and the pain inflicted upon his victims and their families, serve as a stark reminder of the enduring challenges and profound consequences of violent crime. If you are interested in such mind-blowing stories, click on the video shown on your screen to dive into another interesting story just like this one.